A very good afternoon and welcome to All Saints Church in Northampton. To those of you who are here and this, this wonderful assembly of people um, and to those of you who are watching online as we come together for a wonderful and unprecedented day. I said to my congregation this morning that I hope that we would look back on um, not merely today but on this year with a wonderful sense of having been there um, for something that none of our um, ancestors nor any of our descendants are likely to be able to see. A Platinum Jubilee um, is a completely incredible and wonderful thing. Um, and so at the beginning of this, this great celebration on Accession Day, it is lovely to come together to think about um, how we uh, celebrate those things and how we give thanks to God for all the mercies he has shown us in Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Um, I'm going to get out of the way in just a moment and hand over to Bradley, who is the, the chairman of the Prayer Book Society, who have done a huge amount to make today happen um, alongside us. Um, but just one or two housekeeping notices. Um, if I could invite you to switch your mobile phones off, and if possible, to switch Wi-Fi off on them as well. You're welcome to take photographs or whatever you do. Don't flash the speaker, if you know what I mean, um, while you're doing that. Um, it'd be really helpful because our, our Wi-Fi is a little bit wonky and sometimes having lots of phones asking if it can join and saying no is a bit taxing for it. Um, that would be great. If you find you need the lav um, at any point during the lecture or the service, um, then if you pop into the narthex just to the right-hand side um, and, um, he and head straight ahead um, past the tea table, um, then the facilities can be found there. Um, and if we have for any... We have another fire for 340 years. Um, which is pretty good going. But if we do have a fire, um, if you could head straight outside to the piazza in front, unless the piazza is on fire, in which case if you can keep on going until you find a bit that, where there is no fire and further instructions will be given. Um, there is going to be a collection in, uh, during Evensong for the work of the Prayer Book Society and for the work of this parish church. Um, and you'll find in your places, I think, some gift aid envelopes. If you can't find one, give some of well, the stewards a shout. Um, there are chip and pin devices available and both Bradley and I can tell you about how you can give online uh, to both our institutions. I just say a special welcome to Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant of Northamptonshire um, and to the Deputy Mayor of Northampton. Um, and it's wonderful to have you and uh, some others who have come from the, both the Lieutenancy and the councils today. I'll hand over to Bradley, who will tell you a little bit more about today's speaker and about the Prayer Book Society. Lord Lieutenant, ladies and gentlemen, it's such a joy um, for us to come to this beautiful parish church today for this national celebration um, to mark the 70th anniversary of Her Majesty's accession. Um, and I'd just like to say a few words of thanks, um, first of all, to the Reverend Oliver Koss um, and to Jem Lowther, um, Director of Music here, who together with David Way um, have done so much um, to put this event on and to make it such a special occasion for all of us who are present today in person um, and hopefully for those who are joining us online too. It's a real joy to see so many of you here today. And this is the first of a number of very special events taking place during the 50th anniversary of the Prayer Book Society this year. Um, we've got events taking place all over the country um, and we'd love to be able to share some information with you um, on a one-to-one -one basis during the breaks today um, when we're having coffee and tea um, and later when we're having a glass of wine after Evensong. Um, a couple of my fellow trustees will be joining us um, and I think if we position ourselves somewhere near the front of the church here, um, we'd be delighted to talk to you about the many very, very exciting things that the Prayer Book Society is doing this year um, and in the years ahead. There's so much going on. Um, and if you're not a member of the Prayer Book Society um, and today inspires you to consider joining us, um, I've got my iPad with me and I can help people join online. And we've got a discount code. Um, if you enter the discount code ACCESSION, you'll get 25% off your first year of membership. Um, so we'd love to talk to you about that um, at the at coffee time um, and later when we're having a glass of wine. Our speaker this afternoon is the Reverend Paul Thomas, the vicar of St. James Sussex Gardens in Paddington. Paul is well known to many of you, especially to Prayer Book Society members, 
as he was for some years a deputy chairman of the society. He has a distinguished ministry in Sussex Gardens um, and does tremendous work um, online as well as in the church building. It's a joy to see some of the things that happen um, at St James Sussex Gardens. And I was asked, why Northampton? Why have we come here today? We've come here because this church caught the attention of the Prayer Book Society during the first of the national lockdowns. The outstanding work that was being done um, by exceptional people in this church, the director of music and the incumbent and others, um, to hold the community together, um, particularly through the beauty of choral evensong, when it wasn't possible for Christians to gather together in person to celebrate their faith. It really caught um, the attention of the society um, and members of the choir um, and Father Oliver featured um, in our online seminar in 2020. It's such a joy to be here um, in a place which I feel I already know, um, although this is actually my first visit. So wherever you've come from today, I hope you enjoy this very special celebration. And I'm going to hand over now for a lecture entitled Cheerful Obedience, the Accession Service and the Vocation of Christian Mon Monarchy to the Reverend Paul Thomas. Thank you, Father. Dearly beloved, what a privilege it is to be invited to give the Prayer Book Society's Accession Day Lecture in celebration of the accession of Her Majesty the Queen to the throne of this and all her other realms and territories 70 years ago this day. On this day, Almighty God, by his grace and divine providence, did set her over us to reign. Long has been her reign, and glorious. God save Queen Elizabeth. I am alert, of course, that this is in fact a year of double jubilee, as Bradley alluded to, and though it may not merit a nationwide celebration with bank holidays and commemorative stamps and so forth, nevertheless the founding of the Prayer Book Society 50 years ago is worthy of celebration too. Established at a time of acute ecological crisis in the Church of England, when rapid liturgical climate change threatened the extinction of a native species, the Society was established for the prayer book's protection and conservation. Very great achievements have accompanied those 50 years, and I pay tribute here, in this year of its golden jubilee, to the founders of the prayer book Society and to all them that have led and served the PBS with such distinction and fidelity these last five decades. Your efforts have ensured that a species once endangered now survives and more thrives in its natural habitat. Now this afternoon's lecture falls naturally into two parts. The first looks historically at the origins and the development of the accession service, and the second seeks to draw out some theological themes from that liturgical rite, themes which, I pray, shine a light on the character and vocation of Christian monarchy as we understand it and as we see it so powerfully exemplified in the reign and the life of Her Majesty the Queen. The accession service is more properly called Forms of Prayer with Thanksgiving to Almighty God for use in all churches and chapels within this realm every year upon the anniversary of the day of the accession of the reigning sovereign or upon such other day as shall be appointed by authority. And it appears within the covers of the Book of Common Prayer immediately following the ordinal now, that is not in itself an insignificant fact, I suggest. For like holy order, the diaconate, the priesthood, and the episcopate, Christian monarchy is also both vocational and sacramental in character. Vocational in that it is not a task or role undertaken or a function performed, but a calling responded to in obedience. 
and sacramental in that it incarnates and instantiates what it is in the person who exercises and inhabits it. Monarchy is neither an idea nor an abstraction or a theoretical principle, but is concretely embodied in a person, manifest in a life, a life of royal majesty and service. Though it is our second Gloriana whose accession we celebrate this day, it was in the reign of the first Elizabeth that the first form of prayer and thanksgiving for the accession was composed, circulated, and widely used. Now, it may come as a surprise to you to know just how great, in fact, was the profusion of special forms of service in the reign of the Virgin Queen. The Elizabethan version of the liturgical commission was kept very busy indeed. In his fascinating and authoritative work, Liturgies and Occasional Forms of Prayer Set Forth in the Reign of Queen Elizabeth, the Reverend William Keating Clay, sometime curate of Paddington, I'll have you know, reveals the extent to which the Queen's Majesty was the subject of multiple special forms of public prayer during her reign. In fact, at least ten forms of prayer, liturgical rites of thanksgiving and intercession, are extant from that period, but undoubtedly more will have been in use at local or diocesan level. It was in 1576 that the forebear of what we now call the accession service was first published. It was called a form of prayer with thanksgiving to be used every year, the 17th of November, being the day of the Queen's Majesty's entry to her reign. And it was written, scholarship tells us, by the wonderfully named Edmund Bunny, a priest, I thought you might like that, a priest and itinerant evangelist of decidedly Calvinistic inclinations who traveled widely preaching the gospel. He was sometime chaplain to Archbishop Grindle of York. And as he went around the country, Preaching the gospel, he was ably assisted by two mounted servants. Who isn't? It was for the 18th anniversary of Elizabeth I's succession that the Reverend Edmund Bunny composed a form of prayer intended to be used at Matins. It took the shape of an office of prayer and consisted of proper psalms, exceedingly long lessons taken out of the historical books of the Old Testament in which we are instructed about what truly virtuous and truly obedient kingship looks like in the scriptures, a set of suffrages, a composite canticle, that is a canticle made up of numerous individual verses from various psalms, concluding with the glory be, a specially composed collect for the accession, and concluding with further psalms, and finally a sermon. This is the collect that Bunny composed. O Lord God, most merciful Father, who as upon this day, placing thy servant, our sovereign and gracious Queen Elizabeth in the kingdom, didst deliver thy people of England from danger of war and oppression, both of bodies of tyranny and of conscious, conscience by superstition, restoring peace and true religion with liberty both in bodies and minds, and has continued the same thy blessings without all desert on our part, now by the space of these eighteen years. We who are in memory of thy great benefits assembled here together most humbly beseech thy fatherly goodness to grant us grace that we may, in word, deed, and heart, show ourselves thankful and obedient unto thee for the same, and that our Queen, through thy grace, may in all honour, goodness, and godliness long and many years reign over us, and we obey and enjoy her with the continuance of thy great blessings which thou hast by her thy minister poured upon us. 
This we beseech thee to grant unto us for thy dear Son, Jesus Christ's sake, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We can see in that collect the origin of many of the accession prayers we now use. I rather like that phrase, and we obey and enjoy her. Yes, it is long, but nowhere near as expansive as other royal collects written in the period. For example, and I shan't read it all to you because you'll be here until tea time, the collect for Elizabeth I's birthday, which reaches the veritable heights of ecstasy in honoring that jewel of inestimable price to wit the blessed spirit and being of thine humble servant, the Queen, whose sacred person, according to thy word, we do reverently repute and call the breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, by whose breath we live, by whose life we breathe. It is a magnificent work of liturgical hyperbole, and I commend it to you for common use. Two years later then, in 1578, further liturgical texts were published to accompany the accession celebrations of Elizabeth I. In addition to a metrical psalm, Psalm 81, an anthem or prayer for the preservation of the church, the Queen's majesty and the realm was provided with each verse concluding with the worthy and right-minded refrain, save Lord and bless with good increase thy church, our queen, and realm in peace. In addition, a song of rejoicing for the prosperous reign of our most gracious sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, also appeared in the same year, through quite a body of liturgical materials, popular songs and hymnody, as well as liturgical rites, develop in this period. The poetry of this song of rejoicing may be lacking, but the sentiment is true and good. Give Lord unto the Lord and praise his holy name. O oh, let us all with one accord now magnify the same. Do thanks unto him yield whoever more hath been. So strong defense, buckler and shield to our most royal queen. These ceremonies and celebrations continued and grew throughout Elizabeth's long reign, <clears throat> grew in fervor and in scale. Indeed, the 17th of November, the day of Elizabeth I's accession, continued to be kept by many as Queen's Day, long after Elizabeth I had died and her successors had come to their throne. And it had been taken on, of course, by the English people with all sorts of associations of patriotic and decidedly Protestant feeling against foreign powers and enemies, Elizabeth had become, during her reign, a national hero and figure of the Protestant imagination. On the accession of King James I in 1603, <coughs> a form of prayer and thanksgiving was issued for all churches upon the entry of the king into his kingdom. In 1625, at the accession of Charles I, when the royal martyr came to the throne, a new service was issued which was sanctioned by convocation and which was required to be said by the canons of 1640, but which was set aside by Parliament at the Restoration when certain parts of it were included in the new form of prayer for the 29th of May, which was the date of Charles II's birthday and the monarchy's restoration. When King James II acceded the throne after his brother in 1685, Charles II, by the way, was the only monarch since Elizabeth I not to have an accession service ded dedicated to the day of his accession, because, of course, the day of Charles II's accession was the day of the royal martyr's beheading and that was kept as a day of prayer and fasting in the realm. But James II, in 1685, commissioned a new form of service, a revision of the accession liturgy, which was the first 
liturgy to introduce the words, the day on which his majesty began his happy reign, into the title of the accession service, which has subsequently been dropped. The form of prayer fell out of use after the so-called glorious revolution, only to be restored again during the reign of Queen Anne, and all her successors to the English throne have used a form of it since. Now, it's worth noting here that, albeit what may appear to be a technical distinction, between the Book of Common Prayer and the Liturgy of the Church of England, on the one hand, and the accession service as we have it now. Those of you who are very well acquainted with your copy of the prayer book and the layout of the prayer book, you will know that immediately following the accession service and before the Articles of Religion, there is printed the Royal Warrant, which gives authority for the use of the accession service. In the current Book of Common Prayer, it says that our will and pleasure is that the forms of prayer and service hereunto annexed be forthwith printed and published and annexed to the Book of Common Prayer and Liturgy of the Church of England to be used yearly on the 6th day of February in all churches and chapels within the provinces of Canterbury and York. That's the royal warrant. Now this warrant indicates, carefully stating, that the accession service, this form of prayer with thanksgiving, is not part of the Book of Common Prayer, but rather is annexed unto the Book of Common Prayer. Yes, it appears within the pages of the prayer book, but it is not a permanent part of it. It can be, indeed historically has been, multiply amended, and indeed could be revoked by the same royal warrant. Whereas the Crown has no authority whatsoever to alter the liturgy and doctrine of the Book of Common Prayer, it does, for historical reasons, have the power to annex to the prayer book forms of prayer for occasional use. Royal authority has its limits, and the doctrine of the Church is beyond the reach of the Crown. To understand why it is that the accession service is annexed unto and is not part of the Book of Common Prayer, it would be helpful to know, just briefly, that what we call the accession service was once only one of four different forms of prayer and thanksgiving annexed to the prayer book by virtue of the royal warrant. Until 1859, that was the year of the great liturgical cull, the accession service was once one of a quartet of special and occasional services for use on what was commonly called state holy days. Previously, liturgical provision for the observance of three other royal days in addition to the accession of the reigning sovereign had been provided. They were the 5th of November, remembering the gunpowder treason, the 30th of January, commemorating the royal martyr, and the 29th of May, the birthday of Charles II and the date of the Restoration, Oak Apple Day. These three forms of prayer were once authorized by Act of Parliament, but when Convocation had finished the work of revising the Book of Common Prayer in 1661, these occasional forms of prayer, which had also undergone significant revision and amendment, were sanctioned again by convocation and the crown, but not sent to Parliament. Therefore, they do not have the force of law. Hence, these forms of prayer were annexed unto. It means they could also be amended and revoked by the exercise of the same royal authority. Hence, the warrant is printed in the prayer book so that we might understand that more clearly. Only the accession service survived this great liturgical cull in 1859 when Queen Victoria commanded that the other forms of prayer, the gunpowder treason, Charles I and the restoration, be removed from the prayer book and convocation be asked to revise the service for the accession day. Convocation obediently went about its work 
This raised a number of questions amongst the liturgical scholars to whom responsibility of revision had been given. For these men argued that revising the existing form of prayer for accession day was near impossible. The liturgy had under undergone over generations multiple amendments and adaptations since 1576. So it was proposed that instead of revising what existed, a wholly new form of prayer with thanksgiving for the accession be composed. In fact, it was suggested that three forms of prayer were necessary. This was eventually agreed upon, and this is what we have annexed in the Book of Common Prayer today. The first form provided a new set of proper psalms, lessons, suffrages, and prayers for the use of matins and evensong. The second form provided a proper collect, epistle, and gospel for, a for the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. And the third form was intended as a stand-alone service, not for use at matins or evensong, but independently, beginning with the Te Deum Laudamus, with suffrages and collects, and concluding with a blessing. But it wasn't until the 9th of November 1901 that these three new forms of prayer with thanksgiving to Almighty God were finally authorized in the reign of King Edward VII. And saving for a few very minor amendments since then, we have used that form of prayer and thanksgiving ever since in our annual thanksgivings to Almighty God for the coming to her throne of our most gracious sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth. What then do the prayers of the accession service teach us about the character and the vocation of Christian monarchy? What does the liturgy say about kingship? Well, let me, in this second part of my talk, propose four theological and spiritual themes for us to consider this accession day. The first is the sovereignty of God. Note just how the collects for the accession begin. O God, who providest for thy people by thy power, and rulest over them in love, says the first. O Lord our God, who upholdest and governest all things by the word of thy power, says the second. Almighty God, who rulest over all the kingdoms of the world, and dost order them according to thy good pleasure, begins the third. The accession prayers set forth a deeply biblical view of kingship as an institution subordinated to the divine sovereignty of God. God is the one who rules and reigns. He is the one who orders and upholds all things. He is the king, universal, eternal, transcendent and mysterious. This same theological idea is consistently set forth in all of the royal related prayers found in the prayer book, and there are quite a number. In fact, we might say that in a liturgical book that has such a developed doctrine of the crown and the monarch over the church is also, interestingly, the same book that marks out the boundary of royal power so clearly by continually placing that power in relation to the divine power. Take, for example, the prayer for the monarch at the Holy Eucharist. Almighty God, whose kingdom is everlasting and power infinite, so rule the heart of thy chosen servant Elizabeth our Queen. In the state prayers of Matins and Evensong, the same is reinforced. There God is addressed as high and mighty, King of kings, Lord of lords, the only ruler of princes. What all these prayers are doing is to establish the biblical belief that no thing has supremacy but God. 
No thing is to be taken to be God, which is not God. And that the prince is upheld in his royal power and dignity is he is only upheld in his royal power and dignity in the measure that he is obedient to the divine sovereignty of God. The Old Testament is repeatedly insisting on this, describing God as reigning eternally, alone in possessing an everlasting kingdom, uniquely in having dominion over all things and peoples. God alone is transcendently king forever, Psalm 10, and a great king above all gods, Psalm 95. He is the living and the personal king. God is the holy and the righteous king. The doctrine of the prayer book teaches us that the king is only king in the measure that he is a subject of the divine king. And having established this theme of the sovereignty of God in and over all things, we can then begin, as the accession liturgy does, to understand monarchy and its vocation aright, and to understand it in relation to the one who is its source and who is its legitimacy. What at once flows from that principle is that all things are set in service of the divine kingship of God, and none more so than the monarch. The institution of the monarchy is God's instrument, and the person of the monarch is God's servant. And this is the second theme that I invite you to meditate upon today. Listen to what the accession service says. We yield thee unfeigned thanks, for that thou wast pleased, as on this day, to set thy servant, our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, upon the throne of this realm. Only a Christian liturgy could understand and express sovereignty in terms of servanthood because the King of kings and Lord of lords came in his holy incarnation not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. At the very heart of our faith is the servanthood of the divine king. Monarchy is a kind of sacrament of this servanthood. God's downward trajectory in the Incarnation, ever downward in ever greater self-emptying in the person of the Son, this for us is the very pattern and model of Christian monarchy. The language then of sovereignty and servanthood, which, by the way, are utterly contrary states of being from any secular perspective, Secularity demands, in fact, that sovereign and servant be in antagonistic conflict with one another. Note what prevails in our culture at the moment. The master-slave dynamic is to be smashed. No, in the light of the incarnation, servanthood and sovereignty become inseparable. For the Christian Church, sovereignty and servanthood are united and perfected cruciformly, brought together upon the cross upon which the God-man reigns in suffering, that is, in the fulfillment of his perfect filial obedience and servanthood. It is the scandal and paradox of the cross that the kingdom of God is fully revealed there. Therefore, to profess Christ as king and to be anointed with holy chrism is to be consecrated to follow his pattern of servanthood. And few have done this 
to the uttermost, more than Her Majesty the Queen. In God's covenant with the Jews at Sinai, he reveals what his kingship is like. He reveals it not merely to be juridical, but personal and moral. God gives Moses and the people of Israel a body of law, a covenant, so that their common life may be ordered morally as God wishes it to be ordered. And through their liturgical life, which is also must carefully accord to God's divine law, they are to orient themselves toward their creator in praise, in adoration, and in love. Later in the Old Testament, we see the prophet Samuel being asked by the Israelites, a settled people now, for a king to rule over them. They are given a king reluctantly, but only so that that king might serve God's purpose of ordering his people rightly, justly, obediently, morally. Kings who fulfill this vocation are honored in the Bible. Kings who do not are condemned. Kingship in Israel, then, has a unique role in ordering Hebrew society toward God. The king is to arrange the affairs of the kingdom so that they conform ever more closely and faithfully to the covenant with God and God's purposes for them. And this is our third theme, ordering the kingdom towards God. The prayers of the accession service understand monarchy to have this moral purpose. Note, not moralistic, but this deeply moral purpose. The accession prayers, one accession prayer says, let thy wisdom be her guide and let thine arm strengthen her. Okay. Let truth and justice, holiness and righteousness, peace and charity abound in her days. The Christian monarch, like the kings of Israel of old, the Christian monarch is to do no less than to use the royal power to order the affairs of the realm toward the kingdom of God, to labor in service in order that the temporal arrangements of the realm accord with God's wishes for human society and its flourishing. When any society abounds with truth and justice, holiness and righteousness, peace and charity, then it is a society truly ordered toward God, who is the summum bonum, the highest good, from whom all good things do come, and toward whom all things are rightly ordered. And this leads me to the final theme. And it is an eschatological one. That is, it finds its fulfillment in the end things, beyond death, in the kingdom that is coming. Now, the Book of Common Prayer is very coy when it comes to praying for those who have departed this life in God's faith and fear. However, when it comes to the monarch, the prayer book is positively enthusiastic in praying for his or her eternal soul before he or she dies. The accession rite is no exception. The first collect asks that having persevered in good works unto the end, the monarch may by thy guidance come to thine everlasting kingdom. The second collect prays that after death, the monarch may attain everlasting life and glory. And the third collect asks God to crown her with everlasting life. But perhaps these petitions ought not to be overlooked. They are certainly very much more than mere pious sentiment. Perhaps they illuminate a hidden 
and mystical dimension of monarchy. In the Revelation to St. John, we will hear this lesson at Evensong, St. John discloses to us in a vision how the kings of the earth have a special and almost priestly role in the new Jerusalem, the kingdom that is to come. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They, the kings, will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. It is the earthly kings who, in the new Jerusalem, bring into the city the glory and honor of the nations. Now redeemed, now glorified, now brought fully into the reign of God, human society is made new and seen for what it truly is, an oblation, an offering made in worship to the Lamb who was slain to redeem it. As in this life, the sovereign is no private person, but the embodiment of her peoples, so in the life of the world to come, the consecration of the monarch to her peoples is realized in this almost priestly way, bringing them in and embodying them in and offering them up in the new Jerusalem and in the presence of the Lamb. I wonder then, praying that the sovereign may come into God's everlasting kingdom is to affirm our belief in the eschatological purposes of God, that is, that he will bring in the kingdom that is coming, and that the monarch's vocation in this life to order the realm unto God in obedience, faithfulness, and virtue finds its perfect fulfillment in bringing her peoples into the new Jerusalem, there to worship God, world without end. Thank you. I'm sure you'll all want to join me um, in thanking our speaker very much indeed for that wonderfully rich and thoughtful lecture. Um, the historical material, of course, um, but especially the relationship um, between sovereignty and servanthood, um, which we see so clearly um, in our sovereign queen, um, but also, above all, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, thank you so much, Father, um, for that wonderful thank lecture. You. We're not going to take any questions. Um, we're going to go straight to tea now, um, an opportunity for tea and conversation, um, and then we gather again at 4.30 for Coral Evensong. Thank you indeed. I shall happily move among you in the reception. So if you do want to complain, then you can collar me over a jammy dodger.
rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times most humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, open thou our lips. O oh God, make speed to save us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost.
A very warm welcome to Cora Evensong at All Saints Church in Northampton, to those who are joining us in person, and to those joining us online as we join our prayer at this evening hour in thanksgiving to God for his mercies this day and in thanksgiving for 70 years since the accession of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. In this service, we welcome the Reverend Canon Bruce Ruddock, who is to be our preacher, as well as guests in our congregation, including the Lord Lieutenant of Northamptonshire, the Deputy Mayor of Northampton, and all the guests from the town, the county, and members of the Prayer Book Society. The choir sings the psalm appointed for this evening, Psalm 121. reading from the book Proverbs. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places, by the way in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy 
and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Here ends the first lesson. A reading from the Revelation to St. John the Divine. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honour into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there and they shall bring the glory and honour of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. 
and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and, the, and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servant shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and, their, and his name shall be written in their foreheads. Here ends the second lesson. Let us profess together the faith of the Church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again, Descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father,
Lord, show thy mercy upon us. O Lord, save the Queen. Send her help from my holy place. To her, O Lord, a tide of strength. And you, thy ministers, with righteousness. O Lord, save thy people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O Lord, hear our prayer. O God, who providest for thy people by thy power and rulest over them in love, vouchsafe so to bless thy servant, our Queen, that under her this nation may be wisely governed and thy church may serve thee in all godly quietness, and grant that she being devoted to thee with her whole heart and persevering in good works unto the end, may by thy guidance come to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. O God, from whom all holy desires all good counsels and all just works to proceed. Give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, and that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we being defended from the fear of our enemies may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. The choir sings the anthem, O Lord, make thy servant Elizabeth our queen. The words adapted from Psalm 21, set to music by William Byrd.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As you will remember, in May 2011, Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh made a historic visit to the Republic of Ireland. My family are all Irish, and I myself am proud to be an Irish citizen. Consequently, that visit was profoundly moving for us, not least because my grandmother, now dead for many years, remembers bodies of dead British soldiers lying on the pavement outside her house in Dublin during the Easter Rising of 1916. Now, some members of my family are still very Republican, but every single one of them were hugely impressed by the Queen during her 2011 visit to Ireland and spoke highly of her as a person and as a presence in their country. Above all, however, was their comments that the Queen achieved in those days what no president or no prime minister could ever have matched. In our second lesson this evening from the book of Revelation, John sees in great detail a vision of the new Jerusalem. One can assume that he was writing shortly after the old Jerusalem had been destroyed. The book of Revelation is believed by many to be addressed to Jewish Christians living in exile following the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. It is intended to offer comfort and hope. But we need to note the sheer extravagance that lies at the heart of John's vision. What awaits God's people one day is a place constantly lit by God's glory where no one need feel threatened or insecure, and where people from every nation will live in harmony. In other words, a place where diversity and unity are in balance. But this is not just an all-encompassing community. It is a place in which it is quite clear that monarchy has a place. As we heard the writer saying, the kings of the earth do bring their honor and glory into it, verse 24. But also it is quite clearly a place where, quote, the throne of God will be in it. In other words, those with power and influence sit alongside the sovereignty of God who calls empires of any kind to account. I believe God intends the world to be ordered and to be structured with a harmony that enables people to flourish on the very lines prophesied in Revelation. And so it is the church's task to reject both tyranny on the one hand and the anarchist's dream on the other of no power and no structure. And this, I also believe, is rooted in the doctrine of creation, which surely recognize that there must be rulers in God's plan, because to have no other would be a huge deal worse. So the task of the church is also to challenge any sign that the wise stewardship of power is being replaced by the love of power. And so, as a Christian and as a priest with the great privilege of being a chaplain to the Queen, I find myself less interested in how a monarch becomes a monarch 
and more about how what he or she does with the power and influence that he or she have been given. I've become bored with snide talk about privilege or elitism, and I prefer to focus on the words from Luke's Gospel to those to whom much is given, much will be expected. And in the case of Her Majesty the Queen, surely that expectation has been more than exceeded on a daily basis throughout her reign. Indeed, it is not just her integrity and wisdom, but also her Christian faith on which she constantly draws that is such a great gift to this country and to the Commonwealth. This afternoon, we've also been given that wonderful passage from the book of Proverbs in which wisdom is personified. Does not wisdom cry? Wisdom's a person here. She standeth in the gates. And then she herself speaks in the first person, for my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. But then note in verse 15, by me kings reign, and princes decree justice. By me princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. It strikes me that our present queen has continually listened to the voice of wisdom. In a world where dishonesty, fraudulence, and duplicity can be all too common, even at the heart of government. But wisdom needs to be sought out. It doesn't just drop into our brains out of the sky. The author of Proverbs seemed to be describing wisdom almost as a woman to be courted. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. But it is above all a gift from God. It is part of his divine communication with us, and so therefore it is not just about knowledge, but about love. And Christian theology has inevitably applied the figure of wisdom, therefore, to Jesus, who is the mediator par excellence between God and this world. A relationship with God in Christ leads to wisdom, something on which, again, our Queen has based her reign. But as I say, this gift doesn't just fall out of the sky. It needs to be sought through waiting on God in prayer and contemplation, which leads on to making important decisions in life. We are very fortunate, aren't we, in this country to have someone, Her Majesty the Queen, at the heart of our country, who not only waits on God in this way, but is also unafraid to acknowledge her Christian faith in her public broadcasts. So I believe God intends the world to be ordered, and a major component in Christian thought is that the entire universe is infused with moral purpose and ethical significance, and our faith is based on the triumph of self-sacrifice, kindness, hope, and goodness. Our Queen personifies these virtues, for which we give thanks to God today. And it is just as well, because as we have seen over and over again, when politics and economics become detached from moral purpose, then those virtues become undermined and society suffers. So finally, I leave you with this thought. I have a number of great privileges attached to my role as a chaplain to Her Majesty the Queen. However, I believe that the greatest responsibility of this role is to pray for our sovereign. And I would ask you all to do the same 
as I'm sure you already do. But this couldn't be more important than it is this year for reasons that I don't need to explain to you. But above all, let us rejoice that our Queen is someone who daily seeks wisdom through her relationship with God in Christ and is consequently, friends, an example to us all. Pray. Love a hymn.
O Lord our God, who upholdest and governest all things by the word of thy power, receive our humble prayers for our Sovereign Lady Elizabeth, as on this day set over us by thy grace and providence to be our Queen. And together with her, bless we beseech thee, Charles, Prince of Wales, Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, and all the royal family, that they, ever trusting in thy goodness, protected by thy power and crowned with thy gracious and endless favour, may long continue before thee in peace and safety, joy and honour, and after death may obtain everlasting life and glory by the merits and mediation of Christ Jesus our Saviour, who with thee and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who rulest over all the kingdoms of the world, and dost order them according to thy good pleasure, we yield thee unfeigned thanks, for that thou wast pleased as on this day to set thy servant, our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, upon the throne of this realm. Let thy wisdom be her guide, and let thine arm strengthen her. Let truth and justice, holiness and righteousness, peace and charity abound in her days. Direct all her counsels and endeavours to thy glory and the welfare of her subjects. Give us grace to obey her cheerfully for conscience' sake, and let her always possess the hearts of her people. Let her reign be long and prosperous, and crown her with everlasting life in the world to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only Saviour, the Prince of Peace, give us grace seriously to lay to heart the great dangers we are in by our unhappy divisions. Take away all hatred and prejudice, and whatsoever else may hinder us from godly union and concord. That as there is but one body and one spirit, and one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father for of us all, so we may henceforth be all of one heart and of one soul, united in one holy bond of truth and peace, of faith and charity, and may with one mind and one mouth glorify thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone worketh great marvels, send down upon our bishops and curates and all congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honour of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Almighty God, whose is the eternal only power, and other men's power is but borrowed of thee. We beseech thee for those who hold office in our town and county councils, that holding it first from thee, they may use it for the general good and to thine honour. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful, and lift up all who are brought low, that we may rejoice in thine eternal comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from thy love. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and has promised that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfil now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. We conclude our prayers by saying, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Amen.
before the blessing and the conclusion of our even song, I ought to say one or two thank yous to, uh, to Canon Bruce Ruddock for traveling all the way from Chichester to be with us this evening, to um, Father Paul Thomas for traveling all the way from London to be with us, um, fast trains from Padding tonight, um, yeah, uh, to be with us this evening, um, to our musicians and our service and our wardens who have been preparing refreshments outside um, and a great thank you to the Prayer Book Society for um, coming here. It's been a pleasure to work with Bradley and with Nick and with David more locally um, to ensure, um, well, I think today has been a wonderful success. So thank you so much for being here um, and for making it so. Um, as you leave the church, there will be a plate at the door where you can place your donations. The collection is going to be split uh, between the Prayer Book Society and All Saints Church um, with our grateful thanks for your generosity. And if you are able to gift day those donations to either to the society or the church, um, you'll find envelopes in your place. Um, and if you would like to give digitally, please have, please have a word with Bradley or with me. Let us bow our heads and pray for God's blessing. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the queen, the commonwealth and all people, unity, peace and concord, and to us and all God's servants, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Couldn't see me under the scaffolding. No, we couldn't, but we couldn't see you very well, so I thought it was amazing. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. and thank you for yesterday as well, everything, and this morning. Thank you. Oh yes, come in here. Let's have one. 
Can you send me a copy? Yes, of course, yes. It's my goddaughter. Oh. Isn't she lovely? Thank you. Send that to me, Martin. Thank you very much. God bless you. Oh, thank yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Who are you? Tim, You're Tim in. Alibone. I'm a um, church warden at my local village church. Oh. And I'm Wellingworth, lay chairman of the Dean. Oh, where, where are you? Which is your church? Uh, Eastern Nordic, which is a very small village of 60 inhabitants uh, near Castle Ashby. Wow, important though. Yeah, but, great. Uh, well, thank you for doing what you do. Uh, it's a, well, I've been doing a few visitations um, mm. recently, and uh, the parish share keeps coming up. It's the first thing that people. People say it's a tricky one. I don't know how you do it. I don't know, I don't know quite what the long-term answer is. No, no. Less paid clergy, I expect. Well, we're already finding that mm. now anyway. Uh, and we've got some parish community posts mm. and uh, part-time because oh, sure. I, I do about three services. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I'm not yeah. communion, but we do, we're on the yeah. 16, 62 service. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm, always, I, I'm a farmer in the village, so... Are you? I'm the farmer in the village, so... God, that's stressful enough. Uh, yes, I think it's, I think it's going to get a bit more stressful. I think with, uh, with the oh, sort of problems we've got with yeah. um, uh, sort of being out of the you know CAP and what have you. Yeah, but it's, yeah. farming's a challenge. It always has been. Really. Nice way of life, though. Yes, it is. But um, we're staying. We've been staying at a farm. Yes. My wife and I. Bothering hay. Yes. Yep. For the night, so it was yeah, lovely. Yeah, before Mary coming in. Yes, yes but it's lovely. But they're struggling, you know. Anyway, thank you for saying hello. Not at all. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great service. Who are you? Are you a member of the church? Here? Member of the church. Yes. Lovely church. You're getting it all rebuilt, I see. Yes, we'll have a week on the roof. Ah. And, and uh, they decided. Positive and cutting mender, and then they took the decision, as all the scattered was up, to do some do the rest. Of course, hope it might have been down by now, but right. we're fast. In the long run, it'll be worth it. Absolutely. Thank you. One of the tenants was an alumni who's, who's now Thank at King's you. London. Well, and he, he, he came Thank back you. specially. Oh, you're very welcome. I'll just take all this off. Oh, I see. We have to wait to be 